Old Grunt. That was my nickname in high school. Old Grunt. <laughs> that doesn't. Why are they calling you old in high school? Like, what sort of? Did you have some sort of it was an old condition? Soul. It was an old soul. I looked. I looked. I'm actually a little disappointed you're not gray yet. Uh, was your dad gray at this age? Oh yeah, he was like full salt and pepper. Does that does that disappoint you in any way? That Absolutely. You, you haven't. <laughs> I want to be a silver fox. I can't wait. Oh, that's a shame. I've got yeah, gray. It's happening like a little bit in the side, like the sideburns for sure. You can definitely see it in the sideburns. Yeah. So that's like eyebrow, you know eyebrows, beard, but not like the main head of hair. It's like oh, everywhere that like it's shaved or trimmed or you'd hardly see it. Oh, how miserable it must be to you to be you and be your age with a full head of hair. Full head it must of be miserable. Must hair, be miserable. Not going gray. Everybody feels sorry must be for me. Miserable. Yeah, oh, definitely. I know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have that problem. Yeah, exactly. Right. <sighs> All right. Shall we do it, Drew? Yeah. Why not? All right. I didn't write intro for myself, but I'm gonna figure it out. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 17 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at Goulet Pens and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to keep the similar format that we've had before, some Q&A questions, a little bit of hypothetical action, and we're going to talk about the Monteverdi regattas that we've been carrying around. So be sure to stick around. I'm sure we're going to talk too much about too little. So let's start out with some feedback that we have from previous episodes. Drew, what do you got for us? That was a very apt description of this podcast, Brian. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Last time I expressed how much I enjoyed just random nothing comments on YouTube, like people just saying yay about the random things we're talking about. And of course that prompted a lot of yay comments of which go. brought me genuine joy. So asking, thank you. asking you shall receive, right? <laughs> well, yeah. All, and also um, we talked about that Drew troll from last time who just always posts negative things about me and how much I, how terrible I am. But mm -hmm. so a lot of them were like, yay, Drew. So of course that's like a double whammy of happiness nice. there. And one person, uh, Just Beth on YouTube, actually kind of identified this Drew troll who hates me so much. Really? She, Beth, suspects that it is actually the Dots Candy Corporation. Oh, that would be right? fitting, wouldn't it? Makes perfect sense. Mm, that would be fitting. So, uh, yeah, I guess I deserve that one. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I guess you brought it upon yourself. Um, <laughs> I did. Got some feedback for you too. <laughs> yeah. Artemis on YouTube said, when Brian said growing crustaceans, I immediately thought pen barnacles and I vote we coined the term. Please thank and thank you very much. Uh, which, I, I don't know, Drew, which term is Artemis talking about? Growing crustaceans that or was, pen barnacles? That was, that was when you mentioned the, um, you said it multiple times whenever pen nibs get that foamy junk on top yeah. you call them ink, ink crustaceans yeah. <laughs> and you know crustacean being a bottom feeding sea dweller and Absolutely. barnacles also being you know and of the same family uh yeah, apparently they... artemis feels like pen barnacles is a m even more apt description of funky ink crust seems fitting to me it seems like can't a good, argue with that. Seems like a good like merch idea. We need like a crustacean on hanging on a pen or something and, like Barney the Barnacle pen. or something. You know, <laughs> hang, hanging off the pen. <laughs> I mean, they, they they yeah that they are barnacle esque. I'll give you that. Wait, crustaceans? Isn't that like shrimp? Isn't a shrimp a crustacean? Yeah. Is a barnacle a crustacean? I don't know. I didn't pay that much attention I, in biology. I think barnacles are probably more mollusk in nature, mm, but okay. more mollusk, more mollusk than crustacean, I think. Fair enough. Okay. Well, here we are talking a lot about <laughs> very little. Yes. Uh, Rena on YouTube also said, Nightshade was first introduced in Captain Adam number 82 as a partner to the titular hero. Her real name is Eve Eden, and her father is a U.S. senator. She's blonde and wears a black wig as Nightshade. She was romantically involved with Captain Adam for a brief time. Scandalous. I've never heard of so this was, Captain this Adam. So this was in... <laughs> is oh, Captain... Cap he's, he, he's a lesser-known DC hero. He's entirely silver. Like, everything. Face, hair, just, just silver. Like the silver surfer? Red. But doesn't surf? Yeah, basically, basically, yeah, no, he's like the Silver Surfer with a red 
chunky Adam symbol. But yeah, this was in response to Brian last week uh, when we were talking about Halloween themed pens and ink. I mentioned Noodler's Nightshade and mm-hmm. he paused and was like, that sounds like a superhero. And yeah. sure enough, it is. Rena, Rena called him out. Yeah, that's true. Nice. There it's, you go. In- it's interesting. Um, there, there's, a, there's also a, a fairly well known superheroine named Black Canary who oftentimes has a has naturally black hair but then wears a blonde wig when she goes and fights crime so hey interesting that we've got a juxtaposition here of sounds like wig identity sounds like that character and eve eden should just trade places and then they wouldn't have to wear so many wigs (laughs) (laughs) you know i named my dog after black canary i don't know if you know that brian i did not know that yeah uh, ollie and dinah were named after green arrow and black canary well there you go there we go. Look at you. The nerd and the nerd vibe runs deep with you. It does, because then I really when we were having a kid, I was like, oh man, darn, we already named our dog Ollie. That would have been cool. Mm. I'm like, oh Ollie, he's, he's a what, green arrow, Archer. Oh, Archer, is that a name? Could I make a name him Archer? So it it, it, it it my nerd obsession with Green Arrow did transcend into the realm of naming him Archer. So there we there go. There you go. There you go. You need like a superhero that's got something related to brown in it, though. I don't mm, know. Good point. Is there a we'll brown superhero of some kind? Mm. I don't know. Probably. Ask Rena. <laughs> Rena, help us out in the comments. Let us know <laughs> what's going on. But there you go. All right. So that catches us up to speed. So we got some new stuff. So we'll kick on to that segment of new stuff. What's new? Coming soon items, actual pen things. Um, so kick it off. We have this week starting out, if all goes to plan, which nothing has for two years but if all goes to plan uh we will have an ink promo for all of our yaffa pens so basically we're going to be giving you a bottle of private reserve full bottle of private reserve ink any color you want and that is going to be available uh for all yaffa distributed pens uh which is quite a few of them that includes uh let's see here diplomat monteverde conklin Oh, I wrote them all down, but I put them further in there. <laughs> I can't even remember even though I came up with them a second ago. Uh, what is it? What is Tibaldi, Paniter. Paniter, Natuno, Mayora. Yookers. Yookers. There you go. I think we got them all. Diplomat. Yeah. I don't know if I said that, but either way, a whole bunch of pens. So look for that on the site. It'll give you your option for choosing which ink that you want. I think it's all the inks. I'm doubting myself now. Maybe it was just 10 inks. Do you remember, Drew? Shoot. No, but e- either way, website. you'll get you'll get you'll some free choices. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> This is where if I had Rachel here, she would just tell me the right answer, but I'm on my own. Well, you and I are on our our own. Yeah. Whatever. All right. So that is definitely happening at some point. Uh, We also uh, have some new Lamy pens that are out or coming out. So the first one we have is the Lamy Dialogue CC. Um, It's a basically a compact version of the Lamy Dialogue. Uh, It's pretty cool. It's got kind of like a wavy back to it. It does not have a clip on it. It's got a little roll stop. It's in two colors, a dark blue and a white, both with rose gold trim. I guess you can call it trim because there's not much trim on the pen, but what is there is rose gold. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's got 14 karat nib, just like the regular Dialogue 3 does. Um, It's a pretty cool little pen. So I dig that. We actually got to see one in our hands, gosh, a year ago or something like that. It was a long time ago. Uh, But then it was delayed for a whole bunch of reasons. And then we found out that it was coming back. And we're going to get one small shipment of it I'm going to stop talking about it because we probably already overhyped it. But uh, if you're on the email notification list, jump on it real super quick uh, because I don't think we're going to get more of these until January. So Lamy's had, you know, some delays on certain things and this one for sure was one of them. Um, but it's kind of a cool pen, cartridge converter pen, just like their regular Dialog 3. Um, 439 MSRP, we'll have it for a little under 400. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I, I dig it. I like it. It's a little more compact than the full Dialog 3. That thing looks like a hot dog, um, which I don't mind, but it's, you know, kind of long, a little bit big for some people. This one's a little more compact version. I think it's Yeah, I cool. always thought that the Dialog 3 looked like one of those memory eraser things oh, that from Men, Men, in Black. Men in Black had. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, see, they originally came out, they only had the Palladium one. But then once they came out with the black one, it was like, oh, yeah. I've seen this before. That's right. Wait, no. The Men in Black one, that was a silver thing, wasn't it? No, it was black. It was a black thing, yeah. True, it's called Men in Black, not Men in Silver. I'm pretty sure that their little thing was silver, though. Oh, gosh. 
you know movies better than I do. I have not seen that movie in probably 20 years. So I don't know. It's been a while for me too. You have to Google it real quick and look at the pictures of it. Anyway. Rena. (laughs) Where's Rena at? Uh, And then the other Lamy pen that we have coming out, it's not available yet, but uh, maybe next week or so we'll have it. Um, It's the Lamy Ideos. And this is a new Lamy model, which we don't see all that often. I think the last, well, I guess... (laughs) I say that the Lamy Dialog CC is technically a new model, so never mind. Literally, just talked about a new one, but this is a, di- a different new one. Uh, the Idios, I think that's how it's pronounced. I don't actually know whether it's Idios, Idios, some other pronunciation. I don't know. This is a problem with living online is we don't actually know how to pronounce things, but we're just going to go with that. Idios. Uh, it's got the steel nib similar to the ion. So it's kind of that like fatter nib interchangeable with all the other Lamy nibs, except for the 2000. And it's uh, an interesting shape. It's got like this teardrop shape to it. So if you're really into symmetry, you're going to really hate this pen because it is not symmetrical. It is teardrop. Well, I guess it's symmetrical, like sort of if you're looking at like the end of the pen down the middle, it's kind yeah, of symmetrical. Yeah, but, but, but the way the the way the clip sits on the cap, it's not symmetrical yeah. at all. It's like sitting, it sits on the side of it. I don't know. It's, and it and it, it posts the way the CP1 used to post with those little tabs on the back. Yeah, it's got to post a very specific direction because again, that kind of like teardrop shape. It basically has like one point. If you think about like if it was a square, but you rounded off three of the corners, it, so it still has one corner, but the rest of it's round. It's a very interesting shape, and you know. This is one of those that's like really hard to show online, like how it might be in person, because it's like a very tactile experience. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. It's it's not as like sharp and distinct as say like a, a Lamy Safari grip would be, like that kind of triangular grip, but it has sort of a similar essence to it where you kind of have to hold it a certain way because of that teardrop shape. It's not going to give you supreme flexibility like a Lamy 2000 or a Lamy Studio would that just has a perfectly round grip. So that teardrop shape continues onto the grip. So very curious how this is received. It looks really cool. It's definitely got kind of that like art- artistic kind of vibe. It's definitely a very designy kind of pen. Uh, I'm just curious how it feels when people actually start to write with it. Um, I haven't gotten to spend a lot of time with it. I did get to see it. Gosh, I think we were shown this pen a long time ago. They were going to launch it last year, ran into a bunch of delays, COVID obviously. And then uh, we just found out like a couple of weeks ago that it was going to be coming in. We're like, oh, okay. So let's get used to that real quick. So be one 140-ish, uh, 139 MSRP, so it'll be a little less than that, but uh, yeah, it should be interesting. Cartridge converter, you know, standard Lamy fare. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting. It's like a palladium kind of color. Um, that's the only color option at the moment. I don't know if they're going to expand that or what, but I don't know, kind of cool. It's definitely interesting. Yeah. Um, also coming up here in the next uh, week or so, we are going to uh, have the opportunity to have some North American exclusive Tachia pens, some more Irushi pens, which we're really, really excited about. So they will be available worldwide, but in the U.S. or in North America, Goulet Pen Company is going to be your place to get these things. So oh, yeah. we have had some Tachia Urushi pens. They did really well. They were absolutely gorgeous. They were flat top pens. These are going to be more of the traditional cigar-shaped pens. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're going to be, I believe, five different designs. They all look very unique, very interesting, not just your standard black with some sprinkles. They look they have a very, very wide color variety. And um, yeah, that's something that's going to be uh, new for us. Yeah. And hopefully new for you too. So we're pretty stoked about those. Definitely. Um, they've got a nice uh, like kind of cushioned cap, um, cartridge converter pens, and they come in some really cool uh, pen kimonos as well. So mm-hmm. the packaging is really, really choice on these. And I know everybody's been wanting more updates on my challenges with the Pelican Twist. <laughs> Good news, we ordered some Pelican brand converters to see if maybe, even though these look identical to the other standard international converters that we've been trying, maybe there's something that we cannot see about these that makes them magically special. Turns out there is. They are magical and special, and they fit just <laughs> fine in these things. And I don't... Nice. I'm just not... I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask questions anymore. They fit, so we will go ahead and green light these things. Um... I don't know when they're going to come, but we'll at least get them in. So get excited, I guess, if this is your jam. They're yeah. pretty interesting. Um, but at the very least, we'll have functioning converters. And even if you did want to use a converter you had laying around, we I did figure out that if you just put it in the barrel and you fill 
directly into the converter, that should work just fine too. So finally going to close the book on me trying to shove random converters into these things. There so yay for that. And be happy for me. If I'm not mistaken, the converters that are we're getting, you know, kind of specifically for the twist, those will work on other pens too. Yeah, like they look to me, to the naked eye, they look just like any other standard international There must just converter. be like some super fine tolerance. My guess is that there's something not on the part that actually grabs onto the post on the back of that feed. That's got to be the same fit. Otherwise, you would have leaking issues and stuff. My guess is that the thickness on the outside of that business end of the converter is different somehow on the traditional standard international converter that we carry versus the new, the, the other Pelican one. I don't even know what to call it, the, the twist one. I mean, technically they all have twist mechanisms in them, so even that's confusing. But whatever, the, the, clear, the more clear cloudy one without the black end on it. Yeah. <laughs> that one. That one can be used on any pen but that accepts a standard international. Yep, you just gotta find one. It's amazing how many. All right. It's amazing how many different versions there are of something that's called standard. It's very it's confusing. Not standard. Very it's confusing. Not standard at all. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we're looking to do some more rickshaw stuff. So we've got a bunch of the these inky, watery designs. If you've ever seen our um, office tour Q and A two hundred. We take it around. We've got them on the doors and stuff like that. Right now, we have some of those designs on some rickshaw sleeves and some koozie cases. So we're looking to kind of expand that offering, mm -hmm. give you some more color variety. So keep your eye out for that as well. New rickshaw is always exciting. And then we've got this other random thing. Not really random, but not exactly conventional either. Esterbrook makes these funky little book holders. So if you've got a notebook that you really like that does not lay flat like my you know traveler's style franklin Kristoff dude here like that's not he's not one to cooperate so the idea is that you take your esther brook holder esther book holder and you just slide the little prongs back behind the book and the fountain pen nib in the front of the book and ta-da it's laying flat enough for you to write on now without having to take your greasy other hand and cover a page that you might want to use later with oils I mean, and that's happened to me so i actually was given this by esterbrook like you know last year and i use it all the time for this thing because if i do hold down my book with my other hand i start to write on it and it's all like smeary and gross so i think maybe you should wash your hands more or something drew i don't know i am not a super oily person brian but come on man we're all humans i think <laughs> mostly most of us are yeah so, so anyway, I think that's that, going to be about 20 bucks or something like that. But it's a neat little, it's a nifty gifty, Brian. Mm, nifty gifty. I think the main takeaway here is that Drew has been the champion of this particular product. And if you don't like it, you can blame Drew 100% and hold him accountable for that since he is uh, basically the one responsible for us bringing this thing in. Feel free to blame me for just about anything. He is a pretty good scapegoat. I will... I will accept responsibility for an equal amount of all the things I am blamed for. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, that's all the new stuff that we got to talk about right now. Uh, let's move it on to Q and A. Drew, we got a good five questions or so. Hey. So let's hit it. Well, Brian, we're gonna start off with the rare twofer mm. here on the pencast. Okay. So last time I asked for questions, by the way, whenever I ask questions, I do it on the Instagrams. So if you are listening, go ahead and check out our Instagram every now and then because we want to hear from you. But last time I asked for questions, two people, Brian, asked very similar questions. Uh, PG Zamet and Gustavo Suchu both asked basically, what are the best inks? for flex nibs or flex pens. Mm. And because we had two people ask that, I was like, well, we have to answer this one, right? I mean, no, but at least two people would care about our answer. <laughs> I'm like, I think we do. I think we do, Brian. <laughs> We're definitely more inclined to answer stuff if it's uh, something that seems to be popular and burning on people's minds. But yeah, there you go. fair enough. Um, yeah. You put some good notes in here. My first comment was I was going to second what you said. So I second. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go ahead and, I'll I'll go ahead and throw Drew this says. out there so you can second it. All right. Well, get ready. I'm, I'm going to get ready to be seconded. Yep. It really depends on whether or not your feed is up to the challenge of your nib. There mm. are a lot of modern flex nibs out there that are great, like really great. However, 
a lot of the times the feed is not manufactured with the same intentionality as the flex nib. Someone can make a flex nib, be like, this thing's going to flex, it's going to do all these things, and then we're going to put it on this other nib that is supposed to be a catch-all. That's just not going to be true because mm -hmm. the ink channel for, you know, a, you know, something like an extra fine, you know, that can be super thin. But then if you're going to demand a ton of ink from it, like using a flex nib, that ink channel is not going to keep up. It's like, well, what are you doing? The, the, the tunnel is not wide enough. You can't ask me for all this ink. I'm not going to give it to you because I can't. This is a one lane road here, buddy. You need at least a three lane highway for all the ink that you're asking for, you greedy person. So, um, some 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 feeds <laughs> let's like let's flip there for a second. <laughs> some no 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 no. I have fully fully con full control. Uh, some feeds like Noodlers, like he intentionally makes a big honking ink channel. Oh yeah. Um, he, he grinds those all himself. And uh, with Ebonite, you can do that yourself, but. Mm -hmm at your own risk it's a little easier to do with ebonite than it is melty plastic yeah um so if your feed is up to the challenge then you can pretty much use anything and you might even want to go with something a little bit more dry or something a little bit more viscous with some pigment to slow things down mm -hmm. you never know yeah but many feeds are not up to the task so if you do have a flex nib like what um you'll see on the uh conklin and monteverde omni flex nibs you're probably going to want to go with something pretty wet because with those you're dealing with just kind of a run-of-the-mill feed situation and if you've ever looked at those feeds you've got two tiny tiny little ink channels um, going parallel and they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to keep up most of the time yeah so if you're uh, like flexing super hard yeah a lot of it's going to depend on your writing style the type of paper that you're using how absorbent it is you know flex is basically going to be like the most demanding you know ink performance that your pen could possibly require so some of it this is why you don't have like one universal answer to a question like this because people have different writing styles and it becomes like infinitely more variable when you add flex into the mix so you just gonna have to experiment a little bit yep and they do make uh, some inks, like Noodlers makes a couple inks that he formulated specifically for use in his flex pens, like Black Swan and Australian Rose. Mm -hmm. I think Navajo Turquoise might be one. Um, so mm -hmm. those inks are better for flex nibs because they have, like, all these are water-based inks. Well, most of them, anyway. Yeah. Um, so they have more water in them, like, and they're going to flow that's it's a it's a weird thing to say an ink is wet versus not wet because i mean we're talking about <laughs> liquid wet, here, but, yeah <laughs> yeah uh, but some are more wet than others and that is because they just kind of have less stuff going on in them mm -hmm. they're more more water than not you know there's there are fewer th things in the ink that's going to slow down its movement mm -hmm. so a great way to do that is to just buy some samples give it a test, check it out. And we have a ton of reviews, really great reviews on our website. It even has sliders so people can select how wet it is. So if you trust your fellow man, fellow fountain pen user, then you can take advantage of those as well. There you go. Yeah, I kind of second what Drew said there. Um, experimentation is definitely going to be required. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, one of the Gustavo basically said, you know, the FA nib on the custom 912. So um, that's a pilot nib that they technically call that kind of a soft nib that's not necessarily advertised as a flex nib but it does flex quite a bit um so that eroshizuku inks usually are pretty good performers when it comes to flex and they're not like super duper saturated so you can usually get some nice uh color variation and things like that i think anything with good shading properties is gonna look pretty great in a flex pen uh, like Drew said, Black Swan and Australian Roses by Noodlers is like an all-time favorite of mine. Uh, Nathan formulated that ink when the Noodlers Flex Pen first came out, kind of specifically for, you know, showing it off in a Flex Pen. So it does flow pretty well, but also it just looks really cool because it shades from like a black to a kind of maroon burgundy color. So that looks really good. Um, as far as the Roche Zuku goes, I love Konpeki and Yamabudo. Those are both really good, but a lot of the, the colors look great. Um, I love Diamine Marine. It's nothing special about that necessarily as a flex pen ink, but uh, it just gets great shading. Uh, Drew mentioned Navajo Turquoise. It's right in that same, you know, kind of vein in terms of its shading. Navajo, Navajo Turquoise is a little like bluer. Uh, the marine is a little greener. Uh, so I like both of those. Anything in kind of the turquoise family, I find tends to shade pretty darn well. 
Uh, I love New There's Apache Sunset that is like an all time just shading champion. And I think it looks really great, especially because you get some of that similar effect like you do with the Black Swan Australian Roses. Not only do you get shading, but you get almost like a, a hue change, kind of like an ombre effect from like a red to an orange to a yellow with that Apache Sunset, depending on how much ink it puts down. So you can really get some cool effects you know, when everything works well with Flex, you can get some really, really cool effects, not just with the line variation, but with also some of the shading and stuff. It's pretty rad. Um, and then this one can be really hit or miss, but the shimmering inks, some of those, you can get some similar properties or anything with a heavy sheen to it. You know, basically any ink that you have that has, you know, a property to it where you, if you put it down really heavy, it has something unique that happens to it. You know, the heavy sheeners and the shimmer inks are both fall into that category. Um, so Urban Emerald of Shavor falls into that group. Um, these, you know, you're going to be pushing the limits with some of these properties. Some of the f flowier flex pens, like the Noodler's ones, um, will generally handle these types of inks a little better. If you have something like Drew said, that is maybe tends to starve a little bit when he flex it out, the feed doesn't quite keep up putting anything that has any type of pigmentation or shimmer or something in it, that will kind of exacerbate those issues a little bit. So you're going to be into even more considerations in terms of slowing down, you know, making sure the thing is cleaned out, not drying out, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can get some really cool effects with it. So I think anything that has unique properties, you're going to draw more of those properties out with a flex pen. So, you know, basically whenever you're getting into flex, things are not going to go perfectly. You're pushing the limits of the pen. You're getting to some unique stuff. There's more variables. So just be prepared prepared for that. And if you can be patient and kind of learn the nuances of it, you can have a lot of fun and do some really cool things that you can't do with any other pen. And you can have an absolute blast. Indeed. And taking off my Goulet hat and putting on my fountain pen user hat, Gustavo, I own a 912 as well and uh, wasn't having an ideal experience with it. My feed wasn't able to keep up with my um, bounciness. So I went to a website called flexiblenibfactory.com and I bought a aftermarket ebonite feed which almost certainly voided my warranty so keep that in mind but you can actually select on yeah. this person's website between a two channel and a three channel so you can really get a gusher if you want to um they're only like 30 bucks or something like that so that's an option if you want to go that route there you go no affiliation there you go good stuff it, yeah it absolutely voids your warranty if you're <laughs> swapping out the parts of your pen but hey yeah it's worth it right you gotta, you gotta risk it big if you wanna win big, I guess. Are you winning? Mm -hmm. Are you winning big? I don't know. That's not. I, I felt like I was, yeah. <laughs> nice. It's one of, this is one of my favorite pens. All right, good stuff. All right, next question we got. This is from Platzfürzoik. What? Not bad. Thank you. What to do with pens that tend to dry out quickly? Any kind of special storing, sealing, et cetera? Um, yeah, this is a, this is an interesting question. So pens that tend to dry out. So this, this can be for a variety of reasons. So it is kind of tough to answer, you know, with one specific answer, um, like with anything with fountain pens, it depends. Uh, I think, you know, definitely like humidity can help. So if you're in a very arid, very dry environment that tends to dry out your pens quicker because what, you know, water is the main component in your fountain pen ink. And if you have very dry air, that water is going to evaporate out of the ink uh, a little quicker. Um, obviously, if you have a really well sealed pen, that'll help quite a bit. But, um, you know, for sure, if you're leaving your pen, you know, out or you're writing for long periods and it's just kind of like sitting out for a long time, it can even dry out a little bit just kind of as you're using it. Um, so, um, you know, you, there's no like pen humidor <laughs> or anything like that. As far as I'm aware, that is probably a bit much, but um, I have known people that have been in very dry environments and they've had a pen that just doesn't seal very well. They put it in a Ziploc bag or some other like kind of airtight container, um, sometimes more for just carrying it around so that it doesn't like leak if you're traveling around with it. But, you know, certainly if you're sealing something up in like an airtight bag, you know, that is controlling the humidity of the environment. It could could be something to try. It's kind of cheap. You probably have, you know, a sandwich bag or a snack bag or something. Maybe you'd give it a try if you're kind of desperate to, to, to do that. Um, I think the pen storage, just the way you store the pen, you know, some people, they like to store their pens nib up and they're like very adamant about always doing that. Um, I personally don't like to do that except for just convenience sake because if I have a pen stand it's just easy to store them standing up um, but in terms of actually keeping the pen inked up and, and ready to use it's actually my least favorite storing 
orientation, I generally like to have them stored horizontally because that basically keeps the ink kind of on the same plane as the nib and it's a little more kind of like ready to go. Uh, I find if I have a pen that dries out a lot, storing it nib down actually is the best thing because then gravity kind of like forces the ink to be closer to the nib and as any type of evaporation is happening off of the nib itself, the ink that's in the ink chamber is kind of working its way down. You get more of those uh, crustaceans, possibly, from, <laughs> from barnacles. That. More of those barnacles, uh, if you have a pen you know, that tends to do that and you have an ink that tends to cr crustate, uh, crustify, uh, and, and barnacleize. And, uh, and, and you leave it nib down like that, that's when you'll see like some of the craziest looking, you know, stuff that you might see on the internet with people that get the crusty stuff on their nib. Uh, storing a nib down will definitely kind of exacerbate that a little bit. So anyway, just trying storing them in some different orientations can actually make a surprisingly big difference. Um, and then the last tip I have is, is, is not really related to how it's stored or anything, but basically if you find that the pen's a little dry, your ink is still good. Like you still have ink in there. It's not completely completely dried out like I tend to leave my pens before I clean them but you know you've just it's been a few days or maybe a week or two you know it's still inked up it would basically be ready to go it's just the ink is not quite flown through the feed at that point so you can kind of prime it a little bit um, you can definitely do that with you know if you have the bottle of ink that you filled it with and it's at your desk kind of at the ready you can just dip the pen into the ink and that can usually reconstitute anything that's dried onto the nib um, and get it flowing again or if you have like a cup of water or if you want to just drip a little bit you know in your sink or whatever whatever you got handy um, you know i think if you have just like a little disposable cup of water and you have a little water cup or something you can just kind of pour it in dip it in don't put it in the water that you're drinking obviously um, but you know just kind of wetting the nib can be enough to re kind of saturate it might seem a little wet when you first start writing with it, you know, just because it's mostly water. Uh, but that'll reconstitute and, and kind of liven it back up and, and get it flowing again. So a nice little hack there if you um, have anything that you need to kind of get it, get it running again. But that's, uh, that's my advice. What you got? Avoid bar barnacleization. Barn yeah, uh, crustaceanization. I've, <laughs> I've got three points I want to cover. Hmm. Point, point one. A wet ink is a good idea because I came up with an analogy, right? So get ready Ooh, for this. Okay. So the feed is like a bucket, right? It's got some ink in it and you don't want that ink to evaporate, right? Okay. So if that bucket is full of like just water, the water is going to evaporate slower than if you were to have water and rocks in the bucket because there's less water, right? The rocks in this scenario represent pigment or any other type of non-watery thing in the ink to get it to do a certain thing be it you know shady sheeny funkiness or some sort of a pigment that gives it permanence okay something like that so if it's mostly water it will evaporate slower so i believe based on my science that a wetter ink will not dry out as fast right Seriously. That works. Fountain pen feed is a bucket of rocks. No, it's 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 like it's 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 the, the rocks are representative of of pigment and things. Mm. Meaning there's there's there there are elements that would make the water dry out sooner because there's less in there. I got you. So you're basically yeah. if, if there's if there's more other stuff and less water, then it's going to dry out quicker. Exactly. Okay, so so kind of moving away from just that as a like visual analogy, because I'm just like, I, <laughs> okay, I can't it's get flawed. a bucket of rocks out of my head. But um, <laughs> if you like, for example, like what are some of the inks that you maybe hear about that tend to dry out more like that? Um, well, let's just take, 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 um, you know, uh, oh, oh God, God, nitrogen, dude. Organic studio dries nitrogen. out super fast. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See, I think that, so with that, you have a lot of dye, right? Super super saturated ink like you probably can't get more dye it's, it's like suspended in that in that water um so dye is drier than water like that tends to slow the flow down so kind of like what you're saying um and so oftentimes and this is this is where it gets tough for us because we don't know the breakdown of the different components of what's in 
basically any fountain pen ink because it's all proprietary stuff. It's all, you know, trade secrets and all that. We have no idea really even necessarily what is in there, let alone proportions and stuff like that. So we're kind of left to guess. Water and dye. That's pretty much what we got. More or less. Yeah. We know there's water. We know there's dye. Often there's some kind of biocide to keep things from growing in it. Not always. Not every brand does, but most do. Um, you have usually some kind of salinity, some salt kind of that's added to it. And then um, usually like a glycerin or some kind of surfactant. So that helps with the flow. Uh, again, we have no idea what proportions or what com exact components or anything. Um, but we know that basically water, water is kind of like the standard. You want that, you want it to flow. It's going to do well. Um, dye is drier and the surfactant, the glycerin is going to be basically wetter, less viscous. So you're trying to balance out sort of the dyes and the, the glycerin. So what happens is, you know, if you have a really, really saturated ink, the dye, they have to basically balance it out with, with more of that surfactant, which then is going to, I don't know exactly how it affects dry time, to be quite honest with you, but I know in terms of like flow, or sorry, not dry time, drying like in the pen. I know drying on the paper, the more heavily saturated inks tend to take longer to dry on the page because of the flowing agents that they put in there to keep it moving through the pen. That's what usually makes heavily saturated inks take longer to dry on the page. But I, I would assume that there's some relationship there with it drying in the pen, but I actually have no friggin' idea. So um, it is a bit mysterious and we can't unfortunately say with absolute definition, like which inks will dry quicker and slower and stuff like that out in a pen. Um, but you know, we wouldn't, so we wouldn't be doing a pen cast if we didn't dance on the edge of the line of the things that we actually know about. And I'm, I'm right there. I'm like lost in the woods now. So <laughs> I'm gonna hand it back over. Well, to you Drew. could you could you could have just gone with bucket of rocks, but you decided to just go down a Brian rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, point two, um, Monteverde makes an uh, sorry private reserve makes infinity inks, and they work really well. They're engineered to not dry out, and I actually had a pen that dried out a lot, and it was kind of put in put into exile sadly <laughs> but i was like well this is a good candidate for me to try out this new ink i did and it wrote wonderfully and i never had a problem with it again so i would highly hmm. recommend that um nice if you have a pen that's uh that dries out quickly grab an infinity ink and see how that does there you go um and then number three don't ink up a bunch of pens Aww. some of you know i'm an advocate of only keeping a few pens inked up if you keep a bunch of pens inked up odds are even if one of them only caps okay it can become problematic when you reach for it. Yeah. If you keep three pens inked up, like me, you can write with them more often and kind of keep that ink flowing, keep it nice and charged up, ready to go, minimize the risk of drying out. I, That's it. I can't disagree with you on that, Drew. In terms of not having pens dry out on you while you're using them, using three at a time instead of the dozens or whatever that I might have inked up at any one time is definitely a more sustainable strategy. <laughs> and that's often why I might have pens that just get completely crusted out because if it kind of dries out <laughs> on me and then I'm like, ah, I don't want to deal with this. And then I, you know, have another one in barnacle up. life. Yeah. That's bar my barnacle life right there. You know, I like <laughs> the barnacles. What can I say? Um, yeah, that's definitely, right. that's definitely a good approach. All right. Well, there we go. That was, that was, that was, a bit of a, a dive. Yep. Okay. So, Brian, Nolan asks, mm. why do some manufacturers manufacture and charge more than $100 for steel nib pens, mm. especially when there are gold nib options, which they need to compete with being offered at lower price? Mm. For example, the Diplomat Arrow. Why would I grab something like that when I have brands like Sailor offering gold nibs at a lower price? That's a good question, Nolan. I don't quite understand the arrow and the sailor comparison because the steel nib arrow is less expensive than a gold nib sailor. But I, I get what you're saying, Nolan. Yeah, I but, guess they're, they're I guess they're comparable. Yeah, but I mean, so you have like the I don't know the pilot. You certainly do have gold nibs that are more expensive than. Uh, sorry, you certainly do 
see steel nib pens being sold more expensively than some gold nib pens, for sure. Absolutely. You definitely see that. You see that across brands when you're comparing like one brand to another. So yeah, you go with like an Edison or Herbert or, you know, something like that or a diplomat, right? The arrow. So yeah, those pens are going to be more expensive than a Pilot E95S or maybe a Pilot Custom 74, even a Lamy 2000, right? So yes, there are definitely gold nib pens that can be less expensive than some steel nib pens. I think once you get into the entry level gold nib pens, things start to get a little muddy because there often tends to be kind of a jump in price going from steel nib to gold nibs. Uh, but it's not completely exclusive like that. I mean, the nib. You know what is? Sorry to um to the uh to Nolan's point here. Mm. We do have the um the Vega Pro Gear Slim is exactly the same price as a steel nib Diplomat Arrow at one eighty right now. Oh, okay. All right, all right. So, I stand so corrected. The, yeah, so we do have a few of them. There's there's a quite a range as far as Sailor goes. So so it is possible. Okay, it certainly is possible. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. But the essence of the question is still the same. Uh, right. We don't need to get into the semantics of it. But basically, like, yeah, why why are steel nib pens worth kind of more potentially, or why are they charging more than another company might charge for a gold nib pen? So, uh, what I would say is you're 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 getting different features of the pen, right? There's some other element of the pen that's adding its value rather than just the nib. So certainly, if you have a pen of the same model, like you can use the arrow as an example. You can get a Diplomat arrow with a steel nib and you're in that like 180 range. If you get that with a gold nib, you're in the 350 range, same pen, just going up to the nib. So yes, there's a huge jump just going with the nib. However, I find that when you're comparing an entry level gold nib pen, which is mostly what we're talking about, because that's sort of the entry level anything in like the un, the sub 250 300 dollar range kind of like that that's where it crosses over the most with some of the higher end steel nib pens that's when th you, there are other elements of the pen you're not exactly comparing apples to apples right like there are certain pens that are staples in those less expensive gold nib pens you know where it's a really good value and you get a great writing experience but you know you look at a pen like the custom 74 it's a great writing pen. I love that pen, but like the body of the pen, the material it's made of and stuff like that, it's it's not like the nicest pen, right? Like you're 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 not getting a lot of unique design elements and really exotic materials and and great theming and stuff like that. You're getting sort of a basic body of a pen. It's a very solid pen, but you're not getting a lot of the niceties that you would get if you got a more expensive pen body right but you're getting that nice gold nib uh if you have you know dollar for dollar if you have a pen that's got a steel nib and it's that same price you should be getting some other nicer features on the rest of the pen maybe in the filling mechanism maybe in the material maybe it's some limited to nature maybe it's more of a handmade thing from more of an art a craftsman an artisan as opposed to more of a mass-produced pen you know ideally there should be some other element to it that makes it cost more it's not always the case necessarily, or it might be that there's some actual cost that makes it cost that, and it's just not something that you value. <laughs> so you don't see the value in it, in which I would say don't buy it because it's not something of value to you. Um, you know, but it, it definitely muddies up the water quite a bit. And Drew, we've seen this because it used to be a lot more distinct. It used to be that like if a steel nib pen was pushing up into like the gold nib pen kind of price range it was like really pushed back against and it was yeah. it had to be heavily heavily justified but i mean part of my argument is that a lot of steel nibs are pretty good and pretty reliable and yes gold nibs have their place for sure and are worth it in a lot of ways to a lot of people it's not like every gold nib is better than every steel nib or better for every person you know i think there's a lot of people that like the stiffer nib feel. They like a little bit more of that feedback. They like maybe the way that certain steel nibs write better than most gold nibs and the value may not be there for most of the gold nibs. Um, so you could make that argument both ways. But I would say that if you're comparing pens that overlap that closely in price, you're finding that you're kind of getting like a little more pen, like especially in the pen body on the steel nib than you are for the comparably priced gold nib pen the gold nib pen is tend to be lighter probably more plastic 
not as you know elaborate or exotic kind of thing um, whereas you're probably getting more of those special elements on the steel nib pen yeah and more or less it boils down to how much did this pen cost to make unless you're mm -hmm. a brand who has made the decision to upcharge a bit based on your brand's reputation and perceived value and kind of just where you want to stay positioned in the market then you know i mean that's certainly a thing but most of the time it is just because hey this pen costs this much to make so we need to pay you know we need to at least sell it for this much and honestly i was looking at our website right now brian sailor is a great way to kind of define this so the vega for example is a pretty flat blue color with some little bit of sparkles in there but that's it. it's just one color gold trim that's 180 right now as of this recording the too hot habanero same model pro gear slim a whole lot more going on that one's 280 so you're talking still has a gold nib a hundred dollars more for mm -hmm. the same pen model mm -hmm. but we're talking it's got a unique finial it's got more than one type of plastic so you've got a demonstrator component and then an opaque component to the uh, acrylic that it's made out of that's simply an example of one pen costing more to manufacture because it's got different stuff to it and they need to you know they need to pay a little bit more to get it done so you're going to pay a little bit more to have it in your collection yeah absolutely yeah i think one misnomer is that like manufacturing cost is the only element that factors into what something costs. I mean, where it's manufactured, the different currency conversion rates, what taxes are levied, you know, moving from one country or one continent to another, all these come into play. So you put all that into the fruit salad of factors of determining a pen's <laughs> ultimate price, right? Because the thing is we're on the internet, so we see prices at different stores and all that. We're not thinking that deeply about maybe where it's coming from or where it originated and all that. But there's all these logistics along the way that have to be factored in that do make a difference. Even just like, even the pen material that it's made of can be taxed differently when it comes to like export and import and stuff like that. So pens that are made of plastic might be one, you know, cost of like duties and, and customs fees going to a different country, whereas a, you know, metal pen might be different. Whereas a precious metal, something like, you know, with jewels or gold or whatever, may be completely different, you know, category of, of taxes based on whatever agreements that those countries have come up with so there's all these like behind the scenes factors that go into it that happen after the actual point of manufacture and that all kind of factors into it as well and sometimes you know um that can that can throw things off in a way that may not even make a lot of sense to, to us as you know when we look at the final end product uh, and sometimes, you know, there's a great idea that a manufacturer has for a pen that, that needs to work and it might work in one market, but not in another because of all these other kind of behind the scenes factors. Um, and so that's why sometimes you see pens available, you know, like for example, a pilot and sailor and all them, they have a lot of pens that are available in Japan and not in the US or not in Europe or whatever. Sometimes that's because by the time you factor in all the facts, the, the taxes and shipping costs and all these other things, the price gets so out of hand where it can't be justified in that market. So then it's only offered in Japan and all these types of things. Um, you know, so it, it gets it gets complicated, but you know, there's usually a number of factors involved that are probably just like inside baseball and not all that interesting to everybody. But ultimately, you know, it boils down to, is this something that you're interested in? Do you see the value? It's not purely just the price means it's a better pen or that you're gonna be happier with it. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Cool. Well, there we have it. All right. Next one we have, this is, uh, Drew and I talked about this one. We're, we're definitely diving a bit deep into something we don't know as much about which is unfamiliar territory for us here. Um, this is from Pens, Ink, and Paper. How do you fill a Yurushi Emperor? So a, a, a Namiki Emperor. Um, yeah. So we have handled these Emperors. We've sold them, a few of them, uh, but we do not own them personally and have not like used them for extensive periods of time. Uh, so we know how to do this and we know how to answer this question, but I will just be honest and say, I'm not drawing from a deep well of personal experience having used this pen inked uh that's me personally because i they're very expensive and i do not own them so maybe one day but as <laughs> as of now neither brian nor myself are the proud owners of a namiki emperor that's right um but they do fill in a pretty unique way and it might surprise you because it is a large large pen 
Mm -hmm. But every emperor that we've encountered has been an eyedropper-filled pen, yep. meaning you open up the barrel, it's a big empty reservoir, and you just fill that thing with ink. Yep. And it can hold a lot of ink. A lot of ink. And what you can not see in pictures is that at the end of every emperor, there is a knob that you can unscrew. You don't see it because these things are manufactured so precise that the knob, if you can even call it a knob, I feel like you can't even do it because it's just a part of the pen. It sits perfectly flush when it meets back up with the barrel when you tighten it back down. But if you're familiar with Opus 88, it's a similar concept. So there's a rod with a gasket at the end. However, the gasket is not tight to the inner walls of the barrel. So it's not a piston filler. It is, it's, there's a gasket there, but the gasket only, when it's tightened all the way, its only purpose is to seal off the grip section from the rest of the pen, just like Opus 88. So it doesn't move ink anywhere really, um, but it does make sure that the massive reservoir of ink that you have doesn't in any way compromise your writing experience because with eyedroppers, they are fickle, fickle things, and if the air ink interchange gets a little wonky, you are going to have burps and splatters, and it's not going to be fun. And with something like the Emperor, where you can hold, you know, an ocean's equivalent of ink in the barrel, you're talking a mass amount of ink and a mass amount of air moving back and forth. So the ability to seal it off is actually imperative. So that's what's back there but uh yeah it holds a ton of ink yeah it's, and um uh, uh, yeah. another pen that's similar to it if you're familiar with the opus 88 demonstrator that that visually you can just look that up because we've got that on our site you can visually see that mechanism it's 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 kind of confusing because it's got like a long rod with a kind of seal in there it looks almost like a vacuum filler or maybe some kind of piston filler but that is a similar kind of mechanism into what we're talking about here with the Namiki emperors. Uh, so that, I, that has, you know, that's what I just said, right, Brian? Yeah. I was sort of like formulating my response. <laughs> as okay. <we> were talking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh gosh. I just showed my hand that I don't actually listen to you while he's talking. Wow. Wow. Sorry. Whoa. All right, people. I wasn't, I wasn't going to let you get, get, get out of that one. You know like... what it is too, is like, it's, <laughs> it's like raining off and on here. And every time the rain kicks up, like I, start thinking about that and i complete i hear words that you're saying but i don't actually hear it so <laughs> woof it's been a long oh, it's been a God. long day folks you know what being honest is one of our company values and brian well done i can't hide it that was pretty blatant good job <laughs> But, anyway. but um, I actually spoke to um, a customer of ours who is a collector of fine fine namiki pens and he actually says that you he doesn't need to open up that that valve and allow ink into the feed and section very often because if you've ever seen a Namiki Emperor feed, and I'll try to put an image up if I can, the feeds on those things are monstrous. They mm -hmm. hold a ton of ink. Honestly, Brian, you've tested it. Like an average feed holds like what, like about a half a converter's worth of ink. It holds a lot. Yeah. Yeah, about that. So, like, I would, I would not be surprised if the feed of an emperor holds the equivalent of a standard international converter. Probably, worth of ink. probably. Like, I don't know. I've never measured it, it but yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot. So honestly, you just need to write with it, and then every now and then, when it's getting a little dry, open it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, let the ink go, and then tighten it back down, and you know, you're good to go for another. You know, very lengthy writing session. So they're extraordinarily practical pens, and the pens. Contrary to what you might think looking at them, they are meant to be written with and used. Yeah. And you can actually unscrew the back and let... I'm just kidding. Was, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very intentionally like, okay, I have to listen to Drew saying <laughs> You have to listen to Drew. Oh, no. Part of it, too, is like I've got Drew's like video screen like way over here. And then I've got the camera here. I'm trying to look at the camera. And when I'm doing that, I'm not watching Drew's face. So it's I'm, anyway, doesn't That's doesn't good. help with my listening I've been, skills. Uh, but <laughs> I've been making a lot of faces at you. Fair enough. You could. Um, and to, to kind of wrap this question up, you know, we've we've spoken with, you know, folks at, at Pilot. And, you know, even though these are expensive pens, right? These are some of the more expensive pens out there that you'll see is these emperors, especially with all the handwork and the maquillage and all that. They are true pieces of art. 
But, you know, the misnomer with that is that, you know, oh, they're beautiful pens that you just kind of sit there and admire on your desk. But actually, the artisans who make these pens, it gives them like no greater satisfaction than knowing that someone is going to be inking these pens up, carrying them around and using them. So it actually brings them tremendous joy to know that they are actually going to be inked up and used on a regular basis because that's what they're meant to do. They are they are tools, but they are they're, you know, artwork as well. So they sort they serve that dual purpose. All right. We got one more Drew. Absolutely. Yes, Brian, Marianne's Book Life asks on Instagram, what's the process for developing and launching a Goulet exclusive pen? Mm. How much input do you Ellipsis. Dot, dot, um, dot. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing Marianne was probably saying, like, how much input do you generally have or something yeah. like that, um, which varies. But, uh, yeah, I'll let yeah. you handle this one. Yeah, I mean, the truth is it does vary a whole lot, depending on the brand, depending on the model. You know, Marianne, you specifically asked about exclusive pens because uh, we've done some exclusive inks and notebooks and other things, too. There's nuances with all of those, but uh, we've definitely done more exclusive pens than anything. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, let's go with Retro 51. We did several exclusive with them uh, and we are looking at you know a future potential retro 51 exclusives as well now that they are you know still up and kicking uh, so those are pretty straightforward because basically the pen is what it is they have the tornado and I mean, you get a rollerball and a fountain version, but basically you're starting with the same skeleton uh, and you're just building upon that so there's really no conversation to be had with retro 51 about you know, the pen, you know, attributes, right? Because it's the same pen. It's solid. It's a great pen. Love it. But everything around retro is about the design. It's about the theme, the whatever it is, you know, there's, there's a lot of artistic elements that go into it. That's a very extreme example of design stuff that goes into it. Are you, uh, are you transitioning drinks here, Drew? Yes, yes. Vessel number two. <laughs> Did you finish here? Drew had a whole discussion before we started shooting about which drink. He's got tea and he's got coffee. And he was like, okay, I'm going to drink the tea first because it's not going to keep as warm as it will in this mug. So that this will keep my coffee. will be warm and ready for me. Anyway, it's this whole thing. <laughs> it's very well planned out. Anyway, it's probably the most planning that happens on this podcast. But anyway, the um, not true. Um, so the Retro 51, very extreme example in terms of just pure design, just, you know, ornamentation onto the pen itself. Um, going to the other extreme, something like an Edison or a Herbert or something where we've worked with a smaller manufacturer of something that is exclusive of ours, you know, something like the Edison Premier or the Ascent. With that, I mean, we're talking materials, of course, but we're talking okay, which size nib do we want to use? How long do we want the grip? What diameter? We're talking like into the thousandths of an inch. We're literally talking like engineering design talk. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, we want this to post a little more securely. So let's, you know, this far down on the back of the pen, let's, let's shave it down two thousandths so that the cap grips a little more securely when you do it. You know, that's how granular it gets with those exclusives. So, you know, most everything else falls, you know, kind of somewhere in between. We're not designing things to that degree, except for, you know, kind of those specific ones. Um, the the Ascent was fun too, because he sent us uh, several grip sections to try out, several clips to kind of like tape on. So that, that mm -hmm. was actually pretty, pretty neat. We got to see kind of how it looked. Exactly. And those, honestly, those are some of the harder ones because you basically have so many options. I mean- It's like a blank slate. Yeah. yeah. Where do you begin? And, and makes me realize, you know, a company like Edison, where they're really just designing it from scratch and manufacturing every component themselves, it's really overwhelming with just how many options you have, you know, uh, you kind of get a little bit of uh, paralysis of analysis with every component. So uh, I kind of like it when we have somewhere in between, like we have some options to choose from, but we're not having to like literally design the pen from scratch. Um, that's it was kind of helpful with. It was kind of helpful with Sailor um, because they have been coming out with so many limited editions and exclusives. So we had a good long list of what we didn't want to do because we didn't want to copy any of the multitudinous other LEs that they've released in 2020 mm -hmm. or 2021. So we're like, okay, well, this is cool, but you know, obviously 
Brian's mentioned this in the previous podcast, like a blue would be super cool, but they actually had come out with kind of, you know, a good amount of blue pens Mm -hmm. pretty recently, good looking blue pens. Yeah. Um, So we went with something that was a little bit different. So yeah, to to your point, having, having some sort of like rails on this thing is a lot easier than just coming up with something from nothing. Definitely. And, you know, there's a lot of other considerations. You know, you mentioned the the other things that a brand may have, which could be regular edition colors, it could be other, you know, if they do exclusives with us, they could do exclusives with a bunch of other retailers or regional exclusives, whatever, you know, because they're thinking globally a lot of times. So there's um, like timeline and schedule to being considered as well. You know, the last thing we'd want to do is to plan out a pen for six or eight months and then have another retailer come out with one two weeks before we do that looks the almost exactly the same or is very, very similar color. So whatever brand we're working with, they have to think about, okay, what are they launching? And not everything is public in terms of what's launching. So, you know, we may or may not be privy to the other things that they have in the works. So they have to, you know, converse with us back and forth. We might have a really great idea of something we want to do and something that would work well in our schedule and other things we want to come out with. But if it conflicts with something else that they have planned, there has to be a conversation back and forth. So it's always a lot of back and forth, a lot of dialogue. Um, you know, the stuff that's, you know, an existing pen and all the guts, the components are all similar and it's just, you're changing the color, you know, kind of like with Sailor, like they're very solid. Their pens are stable. The models are very set. And we're pretty much talking about colors, like component colors, you know, they still have to do samples. You know, we get like basically chip colors. We give them, um, like, a um, they're, they're more, I don't know. They're more, um, what's it called? Formal, like processized in terms of their samples. Like we get like chips, we have an idea and we're like, okay, we want this. Um, uh, what's the name of the code? Like the CM, CMYK, the, um, Hex code? Hex code. Yeah. So we give them a hex code and we say, okay, we, we're thinking about mm-hmm. these, you know, three colors or something like that. They take those hex codes. They then, <coughs> excuse me, it's like, okay, do we want translucent or opaque or what degree of translucency? Okay. So there's some flexibility there within the material itself. Uh, but then they give us chips, basically like, you know, one or two inch squares that show us in real life what those materials look like. And sometimes we're like, oh yeah, that's, that's not really what we're going for. That's why we always do multiple options. So then once we narrow down, we're like, oh, this looks really good. Then we request a sample of the actual pen so we can see essentially a prototype of the actual final thing. Then they do that, then they come back and then we are like, yeah, this looks awesome. Let's do it. So this is like a multiple month process, right? Um, And so they only do so many of those and they do them with retailers all over. So they're very defined in this process. Others, it's it's a lot less formal than that. I mean, we've had some that, you know, essentially we say, oh, we like this material, it looks really good, can we do it on this pen? And essentially we don't see it until it's done. <laughs> you know, we're just like, I hope it turns out well, you know, and if it's a less expensive pen, you know, it's usually gonna be a little less formal than that, you know, because it's pretty much we know it's it's gonna look pretty good, but it may not be exactly the color that we were thinking it would be, but it'll still look pretty darn good. Um, So it it really varies wildly depending on which manufacturer we're talking about. Um, But yeah, it is a lot of fun. It is very interesting. And, um, you know, we've had, I would say it ranges in timeline between, I think the fastest we've ever been able to turn around an exclusive has been like probably four months, three months, four months, something like that. The, 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 um, we've got a retro that we're working on now that went went pretty 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 smoothly. It, it's gone smoothly, but it's still taken four or five months. Um, you know, especially by the time it's actually delivered, it'll have been probably six months. Um, yeah. We have other, you know, we have uh, other ones that we have had in the works where it's been pushing two years. Um, it really depends, especially when it always gets complicated when you're dealing with you know, more independent, um, you know, kind of smaller uh, craftsman operations. Um, Gives you a lot of flexibility, gives you a lot of, um, you know, options, especially if it's somebody that we know personally, that can be really cool. However, their capacity is just not as great as a company like a sailor or something like that or whatever. And so, um, you know, it tends to vary quite a bit in terms of its timeline um, and in terms of what the options are um, because they, don't have the same redundancy within their whole operation. So it's like, you know, 
there's plans in the works to get, you know, two or 300 of a certain pen from a small craftsman. It might normally take them six months to get it done, but if they end up moving in the middle of it or their spouse gets sick or their kid has something going on, okay, that delays it a month and then two months or whatever. And so there's this, we try to keep a lot of these projects in the works at different times. Pretty much none of them ever go to plan <laughs> for various reasons. Um, so we just try to keep a lot of balls in the air at once. That way we always have kind of something you know, rolling out. Uh, but it certainly keeps life interesting for us. It does. It does. And then coming up with names, that's a whole other ball of wax. That's sometimes we just go in yeah, circles. That and is tough. We're just like, let's just throw some words at a wall and throw a dart at them. That's going to be the name. Like, oh my God, that's way more challenging than you think it might be. Also, everything is a name of a car. We have learned this. Yeah. Everything's a car. Yeah. We have spent so many meetings saying like, oh, how about this? How about this? Nope, that's a car. Nope, that's a car. And it got to the point where we're like, okay, you know what? They're all cars. That's fine. We're just going to deal with it. That's right. We've gone with a lot of Golly. like names of space things, planets, you know, locations. Those are usually pretty safe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like certain lagoons and yeah. bodies of water <laughs> and things like that. Or those are generally pretty safe. Um, yeah, there's that whole like trademarking consideration to be done as well. Because anytime you put and a name to something, you know, now is this a trademark thing? You know, uh, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down with that. Um, you know, mainly we just want to make sure that we're not calling a pen name something that already exists within another pen company. You know, the way trademarks work, that's a whole rabbit hole that I'm not going to go down because that's a deep dive that no one wants to go down, even me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, um, that's a whole other factor. We can have the whole pen done, everything. It looks great. And then when it comes time to actually come up with the name and kind of the marketing aspect of it, that's its own whole yes. thing. God. I mean, there's, there's like stories I've heard. You talk about cars, um, you know, especially if they're selling a car globally. I mean, there's famous stories out there of Ford and stuff like that where they've had, I can't remember which car it was. I want to say it was like the Pinto or something. I don't know. There's something where they were going to sell it. And in Europe, it was like, it was either already trademarked or it meant some kind of curse word or something like that. That kind of stuff happens all the time culturally you know there's there's words that they use to name products that end up being something like really offensive or off color or or in complete trademark violation in some other country um that's pretty fascinating so if you're ever wondering why sometimes things are called different things in different countries um that's why it's usually a trademark thing like um pilot the e95s it's only called that I think in the, maybe in just in the U S it's called the elite in, um, in, uh, Japan, but I think elite is either like owned by Parker or something like that. Um, but there's some other pen brand that, that trademarked the term elite for a different pen model. So they couldn't call it the elite in the U S so just interesting things like that, that you get into. And we're like, we're pretty small fish really in the grand scheme of things. And when we're doing these exclusives, it's like a one hit thing and, and all that, you know, it's, it's not enough pens to really be worth anybody's time to to sue especially if there's it's well intended and we're not like actually trying to take advantage but we are just trying to be prudent and not you know confuse the marketplace so to speak and we definitely don't want to intentionally step on any trademark toes um but that's a that's a whole other thing i said i wouldn't get yes, into indeed. it but then i kind of did so let's move on quick before <laughs> before we before we beat this dead horse further all right we're, we're done with q a all right cool so hypothetical hypothetical Bullet points is done um, so you got one for us drew i do i do and i actually came up with it last week brian while you and i were talking about ah, deep right. fake that's technology right. yes so mm. let's say brian that sometime in the future actually let's say for the sake of argument it just happened all of a sudden deep fake technology is now flawless indistinguishable for the real thing from the real thing and also it's regulated to the point where you don't need to be worried or scared about identity theft mm. but in the movie industry they are using it everywhere so you can see any star past present um with any other star fast past present and just kind of like what what movie would you want to see starring who from what time period and um it can be pretty much anything do you want to see you know, uh, Yul Brynner in an action movie with The Rock, a comedy with John Candy and Chris Farley, or a new vacation movie where the director doesn't actually have to work with Chevy Chase. Like, <laughs> who wouldn't want that, right? <laughs> wow. 
Oh my gosh, this is so many options here, Drew. I know. Do you, do you want me to kind of give you some thinking time? And you do have your you do have my permission to ignore me. Um, <laughs> no, I was tracking with everything you said there. Um, no, I'm I'm saying now. Do you want me to go over what my ideas oh, oh, would be so yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Get the, so get, you can yeah, zone you'll, out? You'll get the prompt primed for me here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so zone zone out with my permission. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking um, in the '90s they were actually going to make a Ghostbusters 3. Mm. And uh, Bill Murray didn't want to do it, so they were going to go ahead and move ahead. So um, they were going to have the original guys. But then also, <coughs> Dan Aykroyd has said that there was going to be like a younger generation they were going to train up. And he said that he had in mind Chris Rock, Chris Farley, and Ben Stiller in the 90s Whoa. as like the next Ghostbusters. And I would love to see that. Of course, they you know, they're not the 90s self. Um, so that would be really cool. Mm. And also, I would love it if Daniel Craig were to fight Sean Connery as a Bond villain. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be Ooh. amazing. Now, we're talking about, like, The Rock Sean Connery, like, from, like, the, the late 90s. Oh, yeah. Um, that Sean Connery as a Bond villain. Mm. Please and thank you. That would be amazing. And if I am having all of my ways, let's do Expendables 4, Brian. But... <laughs> they time travel and they go back to the 80s so you're talking stallone in his prime schwarzenegger in his prime dolph lundgren yes michael bean kurt russell antonio banderas like oh and also sigourney weaver linda hamilton some of the most badass ladies of the 80s oh my god that would be freaking amazing boom done that's pretty solid yes i don't know if i would go the route Ooh. of a sequel but no Hmm. It could be anything. The world is your barnacle, my friend. Interesting. See, I haven't I haven't seen a whole lot of movies recently. I've really gotten out of movies. Uh, well, that's a crime. I just don't have an. I just don't have the time and attention. To, I know. I've, to I, I watch less than I. I would like to watch more than I do. But still, like they think about like actors that have passed on that you'd mm. like to see. What about uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, John Wayne in a western together? Something like that. Mm. Um, I know you. I, I don't think you're a big western fan, but you know I'm something not, like that. You know. No. Do you do you want to bring back Paul Walker, Brian? You know. Well, yeah. Is that what you're gonna do? No, don't do that. Come on. There's so many other possibilities i mean fast and furious is one of my favorite franchises no question i like your idea of the daniel craig fighting sean connery that's oh right that's solid that's solid either that or um pierce brosnan and uh is it timothy dalton you mm -hmm. know have the two of them together i'm just kidding they're, they're both. pierce brosnan would actually be a great <laughs> villain but he can do that now we don't need deep fake to do that true true Gosh, that's a good question, Drew. I don't know. I don't have anything like burning at the top of my mind because I uh, just don't remember enough to actually make this a thing. I did. Hmm. I, I will say that this this is a brainer. I, I took I took some time to think about mine. Yeah. So that it is a little unfair. It is a really thought provoking question. I'm trying. All to, right. Well, let let, let, let me let me narrow like it. Some some kind of like. Um, I'm trying to think if there's some kind of like uh. uh Un, unfulfilled childhood movie or theming of some kind that that wasn't done right or that is missing from my life and I, I just can't think of anything or you could just have a new Fast and Furious movie with a villain from the 80s who's no longer in his prime like what about like 1995 Al Pacino as like a Fast and Furious villain maybe no I don't know if that would translate I don't know how that would do mm, okay all right well you know, okay. Let's all see. right, all right. Nope. I'll, I'll, oh, what about oh Steve McQueen? I, in I was Fast thinking like, have, okay, I got one for you. So take maybe like somewhat Expendables esque style. Take some of the greatest like race car drivers of old, the Steve McQueens, Paul Newman, Charles Bronson, Paul Newman. You know, like all these greats, David were, Hasselhoff. Yeah, like all these. Round them up together and have them be the like bad guys against the fast and furious crew and okay. they're all driving like old school like muscle cars like porsches from the 50s and 60s you know cobra 427 you know like all the just coolest old cars i mean they've brought some of those back into the actual you know vin diesel's got his 70s charger but you know still you like, I like that yeah, i like that yeah 
That would be kind of cool. Now, That'd be kind of cool. But you'd be you'd be rooting for the bad guys at that point, oh, 100%. right? Hundred percent. I mean, right? I mean, either way, you're not really rooting for anybody. There's no actual plot. That's the, that's that's There's the, no that's the thing that could, these movies. It's you're just watching. That's the, the awesome thing that cars. could. <laughs> that's how they finally end the franchise. They just have these amazing villains that just kill everybody, and like, oh well, I guess you know you couldn't couldn't mess with Paul Newman and Kit the you know, Night Rider, so. I don't know, Drew. World, I, don't world, know, world. I don't know if Fast and Furious can ever end. I mean, you can just keep that franchise going forever. I, 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 I believe you're probably right, unfortunately. No, see, not, I, I think the Bond franchise is the best because they've like carried it on. You know, you've replaced, once you re- create a replaceable character that yeah. in and of themselves is like their own legacy, like that can live on forever basically i mean yeah. they're past i always thought it, they're past all the original the, the, storylines at this point they can just keep it going as long as they want there's a fan theory that doesn't hold water at all but nevertheless would be interesting if sean connery were to be the villain he could come out and say like you know i used to be like you but they blacklisted me and you know he could like oh like be a bond like he would he used like to a, be bond. like a 006 and golden eye kind of a vibe but no but no like the james bond moniker is transferable like these all these guys were james bond is a code name like oh, they're um, yeah i see i see they all were james bond but yeah. like sean connery comes back and he's like you know anyway mm. cool all right well there you go hypothetical very cool i dig it bing bang bong all right cool all right, so Drew, we've been carrying around a pen for the last week, um, the Monteverde Regatta Sport, and uh, you know we kind of had a precursor of this one. Like, hey, you know what? This is kind of a chunky, weird-looking, specific pen. We don't really know how we're going to like both carrying this thing around. It looks cool. There's a lot of different versions of it. Uh, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on it because this is not the kind of pen that I think you would normally carry around so much. It's not. And kind of like the tool pen, we have been selling this thing for a very long time um, from Monteverde, and it has been successful for a very long time. So I don't feel like I can say anything negative about it because people love it. It can look a variety of different ways, um, and I respect it, but I've never really given it the time of day. So I was like, you know what? Let's give it the time of day. First things first. Um, the Goulet Pen Company was generous enough to give us a half day mental health day last Friday, which is the day I um, uh, brought this home. And I didn't bring my bag with me on Friday because it was a half day. I'm like, ah, I don't need to bring my bag. It's okay. So I pocketed this on my way home and uh, pulled something out of my pocket. And this thing just, oh no. And I was turned around and I just heard the, the, the sickening thudish clank oh, and this, of it this on, thing's a honker, on so this will thud on, this one will thud yeah and i just turned around i'm like yep there that is <laughs> and ink and had spritzed all up into the cap oh, no. i got a nice i got a nice little chunk taken out of the uh top of the um cap here so it it, it honestly it's pretty well unscathed did you have but it like heavy clipped into your pocket or was it just like floating it was around just in there in, i was in my was, i was wearing my jean jacket and it was in my uh you know side jacket pocket yeah that's kind of on you drew um, yeah oh i i agree <laughs> i agree i agree so anyway it survived that but that was my first adventure with this pen and i did write with it all weekend long so i got the walnut version which i think you also um have. i have that's like solid. the the rose rose order. we don't have this one anymore it's the slightly, oh, okay. Okay. slightly so, lighter slightly redder version but similar okay pattern. so this yeah. this one uh, i got because it's uh currently on sale at the goulet pen company as of the recording of this pen cast there so you, you know um and I inked it up with Monteverde pumpkin cake because it's mm. seasonal, it's brown, and um, first things first, that's a good ink. I loved it. Give me more. Thank you. Um, and then secondly, it performed really well. It did not dry out on me. It wrote nicely. I've got no complaints about the performance. Uh, so, you know, however, I didn't enjoy writing with it for long periods of time. Really? I, I just... I could not get into how it felt in my hand. Posted, it's really long, really back weighted, and um, I did post it most of the time because this just is not this ridge where um, the little nubbin is at the back. That kind of rubbed my hand in a weird way. Didn't like that, so I did post oh. it most of the time. But then it's all back weighted, so yeah. I, didn't. I just didn't. I, it was just uncomfortable for me. And honestly, um, 
the, the the look of it, the segmented look, I've never really been a fan of, and I'm still not a big oh, see, fan I of it. I like that look. I like it. Because it's, di- oh, it's so oh. different. It's so different. You don't see that on a lot of pens. It's got a lot of no, things you, happening. Right, and I, that is a 100% personal thing for me. Yeah, um, but, it, but it has, you've criticized it has not changed. In some of the right nows and stuff we used to do, you would go into my pen collection, and you would kind of mock some of the chopped up looking pens like that old delta that i had the um yeah there's just the a whole lot going on okay one, you've, yeah. you've got wood you've got knurled metal you've got carbon mm-hmm. fiber yeah. more knurled metal yeah. more wood a center band like it's just <laughs> it's just too much for me it's too much for me now happening. i will say i will say it's a good quick draw pen like very yeah. good quick draw pen if you're taking notes it goes on really well the magnetic closure is amazing it is loud though so if you're in it a is. meeting or something yeah and you want to take notes during a meeting, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to do that without everybody turning around and be like, seriously, just leave it uncapped. Now, that's true. I will say that if you're just like with reckless abandoning, just like slapping it on there. But any magnetic pen, you can kind of soft close it. Like you can use your fingers to kind of like pinch it together a little bit, kind of absorb some of the shock of it and it quiets it up a little bit. But that said, it's, it's still, still, it's still going to make some noise. You're, you're not exactly a ninja, you know, like whipping this pen out, you know, you're, you're going to get some attention. So yeah. that definitely is a factor. And, and I, I, I want to be fair because the vanishing point is my favorite note taking pen. And that mm. one is also not silent. So, you true, know, I'm, I'm not true. just trying to rag on the regatta cause you know, you know, the, cl- the click is a very audible thing as well. Yeah, and and I think you're like me, Drew. You're you're somewhat of a fidgeter. So if you're sitting there yeah. like in a meeting in person, now granted we're doing a lot of things virtual now, so it's you know we can mute ourselves and things like that. It's not as big of a deal. Um, but I imagine like in an in person situation, my tendency would be to fidget a lot with this pen, especially because you know unlike you, I actually like all the different elements going on here because it captures my visual interests and it like the knurled kind of texture. It gives me different things to touch. I get to rub the wood, which I love touching wood. It just feeds my soul. The carbon fiber is cool. It's got like more depth to it. So for me, I actually am drawn. I'm kind of like a dog in that way. I'm like, ooh, shiny, you know, but then also touching it, I'm like a child. I'm like, ooh, I want to touch all these different textures. So it, for me, it's almost like a fidget toy kind of built into a pen, you know. And I can I, see that. I do enjoy that. However, that may be an added distraction that I <laughs> I don't need. No, those are good points. And, and I, you, you can't argue with that. It definitely does have a lot going on. And if yeah. that's your thing, then it's... Yeah gonna hit the bullseye but i think it's gonna be like it's gonna be a love it or hate it kind of thing you know rachel hates this pen you sounds like you're kind of on the fence but it it was a pretty solid performer i found the same thing mine wrote actually quite well you know because i've we've been using these regattas for years so i have several regattas that were original that were mm, seven years ago or eight years ago something like that when we first picked them up and they're the fin finish is not quite as good and the the designs were They've always had this segmented thing, but some of them were like not as, I don't know, not as refined, not as like no, all put together. They have improved. Yeah. They have improved because when they first came out, they were definitely trying to go with this whole sailing vibe, um, oh, which yeah. is prob- probably why it's called the regatta. Yeah, absolutely. So the, you were looking at whites and blues and, and yellows, yellows and bright. whites. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was like, wow. Okay. But they these, looked like uh, these the flags now, on, a, on a sailboat. Absolutely. You know, very, but these, these now visually, I feel like are more continuous. There's there's more kind of continuity throughout the pen. It's still kind of broken up and all that kind of stuff. But I, I definitely dig these. And I like the gunmetal trim as well. Um, you know, that said, I experienced some of the same things that you did. The grip, I thought I would, I thought I would dislike it more than I did. I don't love it, especially for long writing sessions. I just, my thumb rests like right on kind of that the break there and it's just a unignorably you know deep and somewhat sharp um step that you know if you hold it a certain way you're just not going to be able to avoid that and it's going to bug you if you hold it for a long time i i ended up using this pen more as a quick note taker and i actually didn't find that it bothered me quite as much as i thought it would but i definitely would not want to sit down and journal with this particular pen every night so I think for me, and, and also I was the same kind of thing, like I put it in my pocket. I knew I didn't want to just like throw it in my pocket because for one, I don't like to do that with any magnetic cap pen because there's always the potential of the thing separating because I I do not baby my things in my pockets. I have cargo shorts almost exclusively. 
I will think nothing of getting up after doing this podcast, going out and like mulching or, you know, lifting something really heavy outside and doing all this crazy stuff. So, um, and oftentimes I'm not thinking very much about what's in my pockets when I do it. So I will abuse pen. So I am much more along the lines of like, let me put it in a sleeve of some kind and then it's protected and that kind of thing. So by the time you have this, it's heavy. You put it in a sleeve like this. There's a lot of bulk happening right there. So I don't, really like this as a carry around pen so much in my pockets at least if i had yeah. it in my like backpack if i was operating like normally in the office sure i'd carry that in my backpack and i would use it and take it out with my notebook and stuff like that but it's a big fat heavy pen um so i like it more as like a desk pen i visually i find it very interesting so i would like to have it more like at my desk pick it up real quick use it set it back down and i'm good to go but i don't think this is like a, a carry around pen for me now, you have mentioned before in one of our uh, very few conversations about your cargo shorts um, mm -hmm. that sometimes when you've got stuff in the lower pockets, yes. you get a, a swinging motion. Absolutely. That ha that happens. Is this... I don't put pens in the the cargo pockets okay okay for exactly that reason um, because... Yeah, you, you, you've, you've given me a really entertaining pantomime of like things just like flinging into oh, door jams <laughs> that does definitely happens i mean even my my cell phone i'll put kind of in like the cargo you, i i will like specifically shop for shorts that have a cell phone pocket yes. separate you know from a cargo pocket which may or may not be on the outside the, the shorts i'm wearing right now actually are not technically cargo shorts they have like where's your cargo they have a i know right well, when I'm at home like this, it's okay. Like I don't, Less I don't put my wallet in my pants when I'm just around the house. I just don't do that. It's too thick. I'm right. like a George Costanza wallet, and then I'm off, <laughs> all off center, and I'm sitting on it all day, and it just makes me mad. Like I hate, <laughs> I hate carrying around a wallet. I hate. How big? How big is your wallet? It's big enough. I mean, you know, I, it's, it's big enough. You know, I got all those fat stacks in there, Drew. It's just, you know, no, not really. Right. It's like I have all of like the ins insurance cards and oftentimes something like the kids insurance cards and credit card. I have like all of my business. This, 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 this is me, Brian. Yeah. I can't do that. Like just the cards that I carry around is thicker than that. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of crap in there too. I have like band-aids and old receipts and all kinds of garbage in there that I you have probably band-aids should... in your wallet. I do. because I do because I, I, I'm rough, <laughs> man. I am outside <laughs> yard working. I'm not joking right now. Like I have, multiple wounds in various stages of healing on my hands right now because i because it's getting cold Meanwhile, it's, it's getting colder we're running out of sunlight and every like outdoor project we'll get to this in the personal section every outdoor project that i've like been intending to do this summer i'm like crap like winter is coming and i gotta get this stuff done like asap so i am like meanwhile busting it out there <laughs> Meanwhile, my son this morning asked me, because, um, you know, kids' shoes wear out in like 13 seconds. Um, yes. He's like, Daddy, Daddy, why don't your shoes ever wear out? And I was like, well, Archer, I go to work, I sit down, I might cross a parking lot from time to time. You do very different things when you're outside than yes, I do. <laughs> very true. I I have a pair of gray shoes that are now brown because I was spraying, spray sealing my kids play set um yesterday as well as the the like wood like trailer deck of like the the pull behind trailer that i have for my truck i was i was spray sealing those and it got all over my shoes and uh yeah so like i got that all over my hands and yeah it's crazy i have one like wound on my hand right now i'll <laughs> show you that drew i don't know if you can see that in the middle it's a perfect circle it's a circle I don't know how I did it. I was I was working on something, everybody at home. It's a perfect circle. I don't know what I set it on or whatever, but it like it just barely like broke the skin. And I put a band-aid on it, but it like it's a couple days old now at this point. But I'm like, when the world did I set my hand on or something where it like, I, you it must have tried to a pick perfect up perfect circle in there. So you weird. Probably tried to pick up some sort of sacred cursed artifact. Clearly. Clearly. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, I'm I keep band-aids like on my person because you know if i'm out there working in the yard this is such a diversion why are you talking about this i'm out there working in the yard i cut my hands i'm like covered in like deck sealant or dirt or whatever 
I don't want to like trek all the way back into the house, get all that dirt and crud all over the house to get a Band-Aid. So I'll keep a Band-Aid on me. Of course, that doesn't work when I actually don't have my wallet on me while I'm doing that. Anyway, my logic is not completely sound, but <laughs> I also forget where everything is. So I, I have to put like... <laughs> chapstick and sharpies and sunglasses and oh all these things everywhere i go i have to have all these things i, I probably own a dozen and a half tubes of chapstick <laughs> to even have a chance of having one that i can find at any given time you know what i'm talking about drew i i do have chapstick in all of my jackets <laughs> yeah yeah you just gotta take them out before you put them in the wash I just hope that I just don't lose all of them by the end of the winter. Yes. You ever like find like one that's I, super old or like sticks of deodorant? Like I'll find like a stick of deodorant that I have in my desk drawer and I pull it out and it's like half shriveled out. And I'm like, how many I don't, years old is I, this? I, yeah, I don't, I don't need to keep desk deodorant, but well, I do have some pretty, that, I do have some pretty old. That might be unique to me. <laughs> I do have some pretty old nerd rope in here though. We'll see. Hey, there you go. Well, that's not and an MR and then and an MRE that's probably from you know two thousand one. Wow, well, it's probably still good. Oh, definitely. It's probably better than the nerd rope, but anyway. So yeah, um, cool. Well, um, the ink that I used in this was uh, I, I went back to an old favorite of mine, Noodler's Blue. That was the first. Oh. That was the first blue ink that I ever used that really just like spoke to me. You know, I every, basically every blue that I was trying to find, I knew the blue. Ever since I saw the Serenity Foundry Nerds Room, everything that I that I have been looking for when I first found out about fountain pens and ink and the whole thing, I was trying to find like a perfect cerulean blue because I've just always loved that color. I was looking for that. I bought Diamine China Blue was my first color that I ever bought. It's a nice blue, but not the blue I was looking for. Diamine Midnight, nope, too dark. So ultimately I found Noodler's Blue and it was like, ah, oh, yes, this is the blue I want. It's deeply saturated. So, um, and and that was actually kind of the basis of the blue that we used when we came up with Liberty's Elysium. When we talked to Nathan, it was like, Nathan, can we basically just take Noodler's Blue and make it permanent? That's what we want. That is Liberty's Elysium. You know, it's not fully bulletproof, partially bulletproof but that was as bulletproof as he could make it and still keep the vibrancy of noodler's blue but that was it that was like the instrument so i have not used that ink in a long time so i was like what the hey let me ink that up in this thing and let me tell you man still love it i have not used a single ink yet in this whole process that we've been doing where it's like you know what i used to love this ink and then i use it again i'm like you know what i don't really like it as much no every single one i'm like oh I still love that ink. Like now I remember why I love this so much. I just, I have not, I've not fallen out of love with any ink that I've ever like loved deeply. So that was fun. Excellent. And it wrote great, performed really well. And the nibs, sorry, this is going back to something we had like 15 minutes ago. But so the original regattas, they were much brighter in color and stuff like that, but they also had completely different nibs. Now they're Yovo and stuff like that. The ones that wrote back then, they, they wrote but it was not like that pleasurable of a writing experience. The ones now are so much better. So like that was really cool because I haven't really written a lot with the regatta since they've changed to the Yovo nibs. Um, but this was the first time that I kind of did. And I was like, oh, this is a significant upgrade. So that to me is kind of a game changer uh, from what the regattas used to be. They used to be kind of cool, crazy looking novelty pens and they kind of wrote, okay. Now it's like, okay, yes, it has its nuances, but it's actually a really good writing experience. So that was a nice little discovery for me. All right, that is enough. Let's move on. Um, we were talking about what pens that we should use this coming week. And Drew was like, hey, you know what? We got this like random like return here or something that like it doesn't have the boxes all messed up and all these kind of things. We're trying to figure out what to do with it. It's a custom 823. Can we do this, please? And I was like, you don't have to twist my arm. I'm happy to write with an 823 anytime. So we're both going to ink up our 823s. Drew's got a broad. I've got a mm, fine or a medium. I can't remember what I have, but I'll link mine up too. And we will give the custom 823 a go. And I know this is gonna be great because I've used mine more recently, but I love using it, so I'm happy to use it again. Uh, have you have a lot of experience with the 823, Drew? Or is this gonna be kind of new? No. Yeah, really? No, I mean, I, I've, I've tested, you know, dozens of them over the years, oh, but so I have never recreationally okay. enjoyed one. You, okay, this will be good for you because the filling mechanism on this and like carrying it around and stuff like that is gonna be 
it's going to be a different element. This is this is a more unique pen um, in terms of how it writes mm -hmm. and stuff. But you've written with the Twisby Vax 100 and stuff like that, so you're familiar. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I own a similar Vax kind of deal. Yeah, but yeah, I own several vacuum filling pens. Yeah, um, I own a couple Homo Sapiens, but yeah. um, that just never took the plunge on an 823. Okay. Although this one is amazing and it's brown. Like, why do I not have it? I it's, mean, it's frankly, it's frankly un inexcusable. I'm not making excuses. Well, you know, we could just write it off, Brian. That's all I'm saying. Let's see how it goes. Let's see how you like it, and we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> all right. So. Are you are you going to use a brown ink, Brian? Uh, good question. you should. Good question. You should. I got to see what I have here at home. I'll, I'll dig around, and I'll see if I have a brown. I'll tell you what I'm going to use. Noodler's Golden Brown. Ooh. Because with a broad nib, I'm going to get some shading on this thing, mm -hmm. and Golden Brown is the best shading brown and it's a brown pen with gold trim it's literally golden brown oh yeah kind of makes sense even though it's called amber i mean it's brown let's be real bramber we talked about this all right what's happening drew word on the street is you made some awful cookies that's your first bullet point yes and i'm like yes, i gotta yes. hear about these awful cookies <laughs> well these cookies when they were done uh prompted me to realize that my son knew what cow patties looked like because he's like those look like cow patties and i said archer how do you know what cow patties look like so essentially they looked like that um i followed the recipe i refrigerated what, the what, dough what kind of cookies were these like were these they were supposed to be like oatmeal chocolate chunk uh cookies okay um and i i followed everything exactly but then you know and i refrigerated them i you know balled them up did it for the exact amount of time, even turned them halfway through. They just flattened out into these just um, this, like amorphous blobs of nastiness. And they tasted fine, but dang, were they ugly. So mm. no, they, they all needed to be destroyed. So that was dis disappointing, especially because it was like a two-day thing because they needed to be refrigerated for 24 hours. Um, yeah, it which, seems like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and I've made cookies before. I'm like, I'm not terrible at, you know baking i'm not amazing at it but you know anyway so that was that was annoying but it was comical because they looked naughty um and then uh today i'm currently stranded at work i don't have my cars getting looked at so uh, i can't leave anywhere so uh you know that's a thing that's exciting the, the emissions light came on um the uh the crv brian 191,000 miles on wow. that bad boy Wow! So it's up there. So I'm at, I'm kind of like I mean, it's a Honda. Right, what it, it's got some staying power, what, but that is uh, yeah, that's yeah, a lot of but, miles. But this is this is the point where I'm like, all right, what are they gonna say? It's like taking a really old dog to the vet. It's like, is this gonna be it? Is this gonna be it? You know, like oh, like, I don't oh, want no. it to be it, but you know, you know, the call is coming. You're gonna get the call. So you're like, all right, well. Yeah, she lived a good life. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it's just. Hopefully, it's just a. Hope. Hopefully, I'm just kind of breaking some EPA laws or something like that, and they're gonna fix a hose, and we'll be okay. So we'll see. Um, yeah. And uh, last night we finished the um, mini series, the FX mini series Fosse Verdon, which is about Bob Fosse, the choreographer, director, and Gwen Verdon, mm. the dancer. And uh, not my choice. This was a Shannon pick. So uh, next pick is gonna be mine, and she'll not like it. Um, but. Uh, yeah, Sam Rockwell played Bob Fosse, and everything Sam Rockwell does is absolutely amazing. So, who's Sam Rockwell? It was a bit of a. I don't, I'm not Sam familiar. Rockwell. Uh, he's been in um, Iron Man Two, which you wouldn't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Shawshank, not Shawshank. Uh, Green Mile. He was a crazy, crazy, crazy guy in Green Mile. Um, mm -hmm. um, he did uh, the movie Moon, which was so good. Mm -hmm. um, he did uh, Matchstick Men with. Um, wait, no, that might, was that Giovanni Ribisi or Sam Rockwell. Anyway, he's really good. He's good and everything, so that was that was a delight. But other other than that, it was kind of a disjointed thing. They did a lot of time jumping, and I'm like, wait, what time is this? And they didn't ever say this is 1972. Mm -hmm. It says like, you know, or maybe they did, but then it's like, hey, it's th three years after he did this. I'm like, wait, I don't know when he did that. Why are you using that as a baseline? So it was a bit much. They tried to do more than they needed to, as far as that goes. But overall, good performance. Glad we watched it. Nice. What about you? Yeah, I mean, I kind of, um, I had my truck recently that I had to bring in to get something fixed. I was having this, I've got a, I've got a old truck, almost 20 years old. Um, and it's a, it's a diesel. So it's like, I mean, it's over 200,000 miles on it, but 
mechanics have said this thing will go 500,000 miles if you just change the oil filter and all that. Like it's Oh my god. Yeah, diesel engines will go forever and it's it's been t- really well taken care of. But you know, it's a, I don't drive it a ton. It's just I take stuff to the dump and I haul the lawnmower with it and stuff like that when I need to bring it in. Um, but uh, you know, I had this issue where like the the basically the throttle would would pretty much give out while I was driving. Like it wouldn't cut off, but the the pedal would just kind of like like nothing would happen. And then I would like is that as dangerous as it sounds? Um, it didn't feel great when it would happen. It was every so often. So anyway, I read up about it and it's it's a, it's a kind of a known thing that can happen sometimes with these trucks. And it was the kind of thing like, okay, there's these things you can do to look at it. And I'm always like, I'm not a car guy, but at the same time, I just, because I'm not a car guy, I like hate going to the mechanic. I know you probably feel this way. Is like, I go to a mechanic, I'm like, oh yeah, the flux capacitor has defibrillated into the who's he, what's he? Oh yeah, I totally know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, you're. I totally know you're not screwing me over right now. Like I'll happily pay. How much is that? $12,000? Cool, let's do that, you know? So yeah. like, I like, I know enough to be dangerous, but like, I, like I do, I know woodworking, I know tools, I know a lot of things about how to fix a lot of stuff, <clears throat> but like cars, are sort of like this black hole in my brain. I don't know why I can't really get it. So anyway, um, th- thankfully it ended up being some obscure issue where they even told me what it was. And I was like, yeah, I never would have been able to diagnose that on my own. So like, it seems to be working better now and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it's just an old vehicle and you get these weird things that happen and it happens. But um, yeah, so basically my whole thing is like I mentioned earlier, I am doing a ton of outdoor stuff. Um, and you know, I know how much you love yard work, Drew. So I was just living in your paradise this weekend. I was, I aerated and dethatched the lawn this weekend. I've never dethatched anything before. So I've never thatched or dethatched. <laughs> basically, like anybody who lives, you know, more northerly, you know what dethatching is. So like, especially happens where you have a lot of snow and it just compacts like the grass down and it gets like this layer of basically just like, crap that that builds up on top of the soil so that when you're like seeding and stuff like that it doesn't allow it to like penetrate and actually get into the dirt so just like you would till a garden to like freshen up the soil dethatching just removes all that just old crap that builds up on the yard well i've never done that here and we don't get a ton of snow but i have a ton of weeds and crabgrass and all that kind of garbage so it was pretty amusing trying to dethatch my yard granted it's like fall but i was like i don't know i'm trying to like watch youtube videos and stuff i don't really know how to take care of my yard but i'm trying to have more than just like you know dusty weeds which is pretty much mostly what my yard is and i'm trying to like actually take care of it but it's kind of an adventure um so i bought a pull behind dethatcher you know nothing crazy expensive just a little cheap thing uh, that i pull behind my lawnmower and it was so dusty like we've had, we had a ton of rain a couple of weeks ago and then we had like nothing for a few days. Oh my gosh. I'm not joking. I had like a coating of dust all over me. Rachel was like, yeah, you look pretty gross <laughs> because I was trying to, de- how many, I was trying to dethatch it. It was just like not happening. The dethatcher, how much- I had to go like two miles an hour because the dethatcher was like grabbing onto all the weeds and it was like literally like bouncing back and forth because the dethatcher, it's basically just a bunch of springs that are hanging onto this device and the springs like catch and kind of pull up all the grass and stuff like that. But when it's super dry and all you have is like crabgrass and everything's all like interlocked, it's, you can't like pull the springs on anything. So the springs just end up like flinging this thing all over the place. So it was, it was quite an adventure and it was, uh, it was very exciting for me. I just stirred up. Did you get any good, um, dust. <laughs> did you get any good shorts selfies? Uh, I didn't do any selfies. Cause it was like, if I take my phone, no, no, I mean like, did you, did your, did your thigh take any without your consent? Oh yeah, definitely. Totally. It happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no question. And like, my, I'll be listening to like podcasts and stuff like that, and it'll just randomly stop because like it's activated the play button, like the pause button, and just I'm like, Tuff. you know. So it's <laughs> it's it's always an adventure with me in my sweated through cargo pants. Um, but at least now it's getting cooler, so I'm not like sweating through so profusely all my clothing. I can actually like finish some yard work, and it's like, oh, I'm just covered in dust. I'm not covered in sweat and dust. Uh, but anyway, so then I also, I mentioned I was assembling my carport, which I got from my parents, which that's fully done now. Hey! Yeah, yeah. It actually ended up being even more of a project because 
where I was putting it was on a little bit of a slope. And I was like, ah, whatever. I don't need to change the slope. And then I was like, once I assembled the frame, I was like, oh, this looks pretty bad. And I was like, actually, I kind of do want this to be level. So then I had to level it out, but I couldn't just level it. I had to actually take some of the dirt out to lower it down. It's like a whole thing now, but it, it's done and it looks so much better. So it ended up being more of a project. That's been my theme lately is like, I tell Rachel, I'm like, oh, I got this thing. Shouldn't take me that long. I'm going to do it. But then I get into it and it ends up being a whole big project and I come in all tired and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, oh, that's, I, it was, it was I, it, a bit off more than I can chew deer. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I, I understand that despite not being outside, I've been working on my son's Halloween costume for the past two months. So, yes. uh, yeah. yeah, not a, not a stranger to, uh, over committing. Yeah. And then I also, um, patched my blacktop driveway for the first time never done that before mm. i i actually legitimately was like remembering from parks and rec remember when um ron swanson first meets diane um he meets yep. her because she was trying to fix a pothole in front of her house mm -hmm. uh, well he legitimately like that was legitimate like that's how you fix a pothole <laughs> and so I mean, like i've got the edging on my i've got a paved driveway and the edging is like the the dirt beside it has kind of eroded away and you know we're in covid life and there's delivery trucks coming and going and if they come on the edge of the driveway it'll like crumble so i've got all these edges of my driveway that are like crumbling under the pressure from these big trucks so i it's a whole thing i need to raise up the edges of the driveway get it all in but i need to fix these pieces of blacktop first so i bought like the cold patch you know asphalt stuff and all that so i'm like i'm having a whole adventure with patching asphalt and dethatching my yard and spray sealing my kids play set and all that i've been like mr contractor like self-contractor lately and i've been having a blast i'm getting to do all kinds of different stuff and it's neat there you go and then you get now you get to spend some money that you saved by not hiring a contractor you can buy yourself one of those uh emperors <laughs> well no i'm gonna buy like gravel so that i can spread that along the side of the driveway Yay. I'm not like saving money. I'm just not having to spend as much money. You know what I mean? Like it's not, yeah. it's not bonus money. I'm just like, oh, okay. I can actually like fix the things that are broken because I have not touched the end of the driveway in like 10 years. <laughs> so I can go and fix it all now. Anyway. Nice. And then the last thing on the personal front is, um, you know, Joseph is uh, under quarantine again. So, you know, I mentioned that in a past pen cast. He was at school for three days before he was, potentially exposed never had symptoms or anything like that so thank goodness but yeah he went back and then three days later he was potentially exposed again so he's home all week and we are basically quarantined as a family all week because he was potentially exposed again so at this point he'll have spent more time quarantined than he will have actually in school so this is the covid life that we find ourselves in and we are smiling hide the pain herald <laughs> through it all we're just like okay like he knows how to virtual school he's just you know a good kid he's pretty studious and all that so like that's all fine but it's just you know the same covid life just garbage that we're all dealing with it's like okay especially because like it looked like we were getting more in the clear in july and everything was looking fine and then the delta variant came out and it's like yeah just kidding okay no same same as last year same repeat fear anxiety all that stuff great cool let's do that all right so anyway we're doing fine but it's just like we're just kind of over it but yet it's not over <laughs> so here we are yeah it's like we're not allowed to be over it yeah pretty much so anyway but we're doing okay um yeah. all right uh on the company front company updates so we um this week actually you know, the day that we're publishing this friday august plan um you know we've our quarterly physical inventory so we always try to give a heads up granted this is not a heads up because you're seeing this after we've already finished it at this point um but uh you know we always like to do it especially this one before the holiday season comes um we basically shut the website down and we count all the stuff that we have just to make sure that what we have on the website actually reflects what we have in our building so that when you buy something you know that it exists and that we have it and can ship it to you that's essentially the you know the crux of it um surprising how many different things can go wrong in the whole process of <laughs> ship getting things in and shipping them out especially with 47 or 4800 or so different products that are coming and going each and every day uh it gets complicated you know sometimes we receive things wrong sometimes you know whatever stuff 
isn't barcoded properly and all these things. So there's a number of different complications that can happen, but um, you know, it should keep things flowing pretty smoothly. Um, and then the other thing that we have is we have this um, ink deal that is starting on Friday, uh, which will kick through basically through the end of the year, uh, more or less. So we've done this with uh, Yaffa brand uh, stuff before. Um, so we're going to have a free bottle of private reserve ink with all the brands uh, that Yaffa distributes. So this is any of their brands. If you buy a pen, you will get a bottle Bri of Brian, private reserve ink. We, we, we did already talk about this. Oh yeah, we did, didn't we? Well, we did. At this I'm point, sorry. it's been so long. No, you're right. I even talk, I even went through all this too. I'm just on autopilot. Drew. What can I say? <laughs> it's okay. I didn't, I'm like, oh God, should I let him go with this one? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just let you drive the rest of the ship here. <laughs> I'm done. It's all good. It's all good. That's the company update. Yeah, pretty much. All right, I'm done. Brian, would you like to you know? Would the... you like to know what's, on, what's Would you like to know what's on my desk? Sure. <laughs> hey. Well, I bought a Retro Fifty One Enterprise. Nice. So I already had the Discovery. This one's a little bit different. This is kind of like the not as cool Discovery because the Discovery is one of the acid etched ones. It has some mm. texture. This one doesn't have any texture, but I think I've just decided to get all the shuttles. So that's going to happen. And <laughs> there you go. Why not, right? And of course, I have Pelican converters on my desk. So hooray for that. And I also bought, this was kind of coming out of some of the things we talked about uh, last week where people were using, um, we were talking about transcribing books and somebody mentioned like um, that they were transcribing their grandfather's cookbook. I'm like, you know what? I need a journal for, cook, uh, for, for recipes because the websites that you go to to get recipes are riddled with ads. They're hard to navigate. You have to like switch on like the, the, the mode on your phone where it stays open so that you can look at it while you're cooking. Oh, yeah. Scrolling up and down is annoying. It's super small. And then you worry about splashing crap on it while you're oh, yeah. you know, like you have stuff like, like that. You have like egg on your fingers and you go yeah, to touch or, your screen and it's just- Yeah, yeah. flour, flour completely makes your fingerprints pointless. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get a book and I'm just going to write my favorite recipes on there. I'm not big in cooking, but I do have like bookmarked a bunch of my favorite recipes. So I'm going to actually put them to ink to paper. So I wow. bought an endless, uh, endless works recorder book. Um, you know, it's got numbered pages, table of contents, two bookmarks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it'll be great for reference. So I'm going to get that ball rolling. So thank you out there for inspiring me. There you go. Nice. Taking it old school. That's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I was going to say, like, aren't you going to like get your, get your food stuff on your fingers on the page? But I'm like, no, wait, you don't have to like scroll or anything. You'll just have it open and you don't have to touch it. Exactly. So yeah, that kind of solves that problem. Um, very cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Go back to my notes. Um, so I, I got finally in my hands, the Twisby, uh, 580 ALR Navy blue. So nice. I, this is one of those things like, because I'm working remotely, I'll like, We'll get a new pen in. I'm like, oh yeah, I want one, but then I have to actually go to the office and get it. I mean, I guess I could have it shipped to me, but whatever. Everybody's busy enough, so I can just wait. But anyway, by the time I actually make it into the office, it's usually a couple of weeks um, after. By the time I can show it on PenCast, so I got one of those, even though we've uh, launched it a little while ago. Um, it's really cool. I dig this color a lot, and it's of course it's because I love everything blue. But really great color. I'm I'm really digging it. Is it better than Prussian though? Um, it's different. It's different. I like that one too a lot. I wouldn't. I don't know if it's better. I don't know if it's better. Maybe. Um. Mm, I don't know. You can't make me choose that. I know. I don't know why I asked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably not. I would say Prussian. I like Prussian. I like more. But I knew that I liked Prussian a lot, and I anticipated that I would not like this one as much. But I liked this one more than the lowered expectations I had for it compared to the Prussian. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's how I felt about Batman versus Superman. There you go. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then I also picked up another custom 74. So the custom 74 orange is discontinued and not a thing. And um, when we were prepping for physical inventory, we like found one that we basically was like, okay, do we list this on the site? Do we do this whole thing? Whatever. And then somebody on the team was like, yeah, Brian would probably want that. And I was like, 
yeah, I don't have an orange one. Okay, I'll take it. It's a medium, which I love. And I was like, okay. Nice. I wouldn't have like gone out of my way to get it, but it's like, okay, if it's going to be less work to like list it and there do the go. whole thing, like I'll take one for the team, you know. Servant leadership at its finest. Yeah, because I always like, I get FOMO like anybody else. Like, especially when we know something's going to be discontinued. I'm like, oh, I kind of want that thing more now. But I've done that. Mm-hmm. I've done that so much now where I'm like, okay, Brian, yeah. really? Like you have so many pens. Do you actually really need this thing? But I'm like, Custom 74 is like my pen. So I really, I really should have every color of Custom 74. I, for some reason, I haven't just felt compelled to collect every single option, but I'm getting there. I'm getting pretty darn close. <laughs> I might, I might have close to every color at this point. I need to gather that up, actually, Drew. That's a good question that I the, just the, could summarize. The teal, the teal, and the uh, um, was it Merlot? Mm. Those two together, I think, are some of the best looking ones. So like, good, honestly. As as a pair, they look really, really nice as well. I agree. I agree. They pretty much nailed it. There you go. So that's what I've been playing with. And I think we finally reached the end. We are pushing two hours now, so we need to get our booties out of here. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's all we got. I forgot to pull a random fun fact today, so we are not going to have one. But um, I don't know. We could make up a writing prompt, Drew, because remember we talked about that before? So I think we could make one up real quick. I am going to go off of what Drew said earlier about writing down um, his recipes. So I'm gonna challenge everybody to do a writing prompt of writing out um, your favorite meal. So whatever the ingredients and the cooking and all that kind of stuff, just like you'd write a recipe, uh, go ahead and write out your your favorite meal uh, with a pen on actual paper. That's gonna be your writing prompt for this week. Um, so that's what we got for you. Be sure to leave us some comments if you want to engage and let Drew know that you either support him or you want to troll him whatever you do <laughs> any comment is good in youtube's eyes so go for it um be sure to check out gulipens.com because that is we are self-sponsored basically and uh you know we, everything that we talk about here more or less you can find there uh, as long as lots of other cool things ink paper pens all that fun stuff um like and subscribe to the youtube channel we're on instagram we're in a lot of different places and uh if you are listening to the audio version and you want to send us an email you can do so at pencast at gulipens dot com that's all we got for y'all this week hope you have a wonderful weekend and a great rest of your week and right on <laughs>